The US dollar is used by governments to do things which we could argue are equally criminal or morally unjust. Yeah, and I think as far as I know, the the currency of choice for you know people that are doing massive operations against US laws, things like drug smuggling and things like that, is still US hundred dollar bills. So should we stop making those? <laughs> well it's an interesting area to ponder when you start thinking about there's two forms of money. We have the US dollar, but I mean there's lots, but let's talk about the US dollar versus Bitcoin. And you have people on the state side who want to restrict the use of Bitcoin, which we know is used by good people and activists and yeah, people who are in difficult living under difficult regimes, evade capital controls and such and such. And we've got those people saying, no, you cannot use that. This is bad money. Yet we are on the other flip side, seeing them as the state having full control to print, debase, use that money to fund things that we all fundamentally disagree with, which is forever wars and economic imperialism throughout the world. And it's that interesting kind of like uh, comparison in that when you try and, this is what you need to try and communicate to people, but that means you have to, ha you have to almost come to a place where you have a complete loss of faith within government or what you've believed has been right or true your whole time. Yeah, I think that, most people are not aware of who is using Bitcoin. Yeah. I think they think of it as like tech people on the West Coast and criminals. Specifically people who are, you know, breaking US laws and living in the US. And they the stories of people who are using Bitcoin in places like Belarus and Vietnam and Afghanistan and North Korea <laughs> and, and the list goes on um, are you know, being told on your show and in Bitcoin magazine and every once in a while, maybe in Forbes or something, but never in, in venues that most people that I talk to who aren't in Bitcoin read. So they don't hear about the good stuff. And I mean, one of the things I talk about in my critical thinking course is uh, what's called the evidence primacy effect. So the evidence that you get first will always shape your view of the thing that you're getting evidence about. And so if I tell you about this jerk, you know, that I met um, and then I start telling you, he, you know, he's a really good father and so on. You'll still, you'll try to reinterpret all the later stuff in light of believing that he's a jerk. Cause that's the first thing I said. And so if the first thing people hear about Bitcoin is how, as how people are using it to break laws, then they have to, they have to interpret everything else. They don't have to, but they tend to interpret everything else through that lens. Can I, can I be for this thing that does this really bad thing? Whereas if you first introduce it to them by explaining, you know, the story of Roya Maboob or something like that, then the other stuff they'll interpret in light of that. Okay, so here, I know this is how Bitcoin brings freedom to people. Is it worth the cost of energy to do that? Is it worth potentially um, limiting the ability of governments to respond to crises by having this competitor and things like that? So what evidence you get first matters a lot. And unfortunately, people are getting most people are getting the bad stuff first. This is why when you speak to most people, they say, well, yeah, it was two or three to four touch points before they finally went in. And that's why people then like the New York Times are making this job really hard for all of us by leading with misinformation. And the interesting part of that is, is it's not so much the, you know, we're talking about the New York Times article this week. It's not so much that article. The interesting point for that is when you see who's retweeted the article and then you go in, especially if they've retweeted with comment, then go and look at the comments and discussions afterwards. These people are already attacking. The people who retweeted mm. are already attacking Bitcoin. And you already know they, they only know as much as they've read in that article. They don't really know. But they're instantly becoming part of the anti-Bitcoin crowd. Mm -hmm. And what do you do about that? <laughs> yeah, or they, they've had some inkling, some yeah. association with Bitcoin and negativity in, in some way. Or they're on the and then this is index. like, yes. So anytime someone gives you evidence that allows you to continue to believe something you have you already believe, you welcome it with open arms and you love it. Um, and anytime someone gives you evidence that contradicts what you believe, you tend to entrench and actually believe str more strongly in the, in the thing you already believed. Um, it's a, a sort of possession model of belief. Like someone is attacking something that's mine. I need to fight them off. Um, and that, it's a really bad way of 
of ending up with true beliefs. <laughs> why, why is there therefore such an inertia to, to people admitting they may be wrong? Because it's actually a liberating thing. You know, when, when you go out and say, you know what, I, this thing I thought I was wrong, I'm sorry. M majority of people are like, oh, well, well done. That's a, like people commend people you. Love for you yeah. yeah, they love you and they commend you for it. They're like, okay, you're flawed, you, but you're honest. Yet there seems to be an inertia to admitting you're wrong. Yeah. I think this, this comes from deep psychological tendencies within us to want to believe what the group believes. And that was very advantageous when we were hunter gatherers and sort of, th there's been some really interesting philosophical work recently on like when to, um, when to go against the, the group's beliefs, when to be an, uh, a rebel and when to sort of toe the line and what causes people to choose to do one or the other. So yeah, it was for a long time, a really good idea for communities to cast out people who went against the community because it was hard to survive and you needed everyone working together. Um, and vestiges of that are not serving us well these days when we apply it to more abstract theoretical things. Like if everyone thinks that, that they heard something that they can kill and eat over there and you think that it was over there and you're insisting on, on going on everyone going that way, um, they probably should leave you behind because you're not helping <laughs> survive. Now we apply that to, you know, abstract political philosophical discussions. And we still have our, our same mindset toward those beliefs, which is, this is mine. I'm going to keep it. This is what me and my friends believe. Um, and it costs us a lot to, to go against that. So that, that's probably a lot of the reason why the, there's kind of like for a long period of time, there's this group thing within Bitcoin, mm -hmm. whether it's, agreements about what bitcoin is or should be or small blocks but also then it starts to uh expand into other topics like i'm a carnivore i don't eat seed oils because there's like this group think that goes with it and that i guess is because bitcoin could be attacked from the outside whether mm -hmm. it's media government whoever wanted to attack it so they became strong as a unit by saying these are our core beliefs and anyone who didn't follow the core beliefs was ejected because they were essentially a weakness within that defensive system. Is that basically what you're saying? Is, is that applicable to Bitcoin in that exact way? I hadn't been thinking about it at the time, but absolutely. Even some of the metaphors like cyber hornets and things like that, think of it as this community that stands together to fight off not just attacks on Bitcoin, but attacks on eating vegetables and, and things like that. Can that then also become a weakness? Absolutely. And in every area of thought, it becomes a weakness when you're not willing to tolerate dissent from within the group and um, something that we have witnessed mm -hmm. um and so what happens after that what's it what is the evolution of this do groups always fragment i guess i think it depends there are certain groups that have been able to succeed by uh casting out people who go against the the way that the group thinks which works as long as you can keep recruiting in new people. Um, if you're only ever casting out, the group will eventually, you know, splinter off, and and when it's too small, it dies. And can they get consumed by a, a larger group? You know, if there's a a group of philosophers, it becomes a much larger larger group than the cyber hornets. Can the cyber hornets themselves implode, and then this new group leads the narrative? I think that's pretty rare. Um, once you have a group, and this is probably trending into like social psychology or something where, yeah. where so I'm, I'm just, I'll just speculate wildly. We've here. gone all over the place. Um, but once you have a group identity, it gets really hard to, to change that identity. So think about sort of the, the Bitcoin, uh, community getting subsumed into the sound money community or something like that. Um, which has gold bugs in it and things like that. Um, that makes sense as a narrative, but in fact, we've seen exactly the opposite, the intense fighting. So there, are, the, the one group's identity is around this one thing. Um, and even though it's a lot of them are holding it for these kinds of reasons, they found their community over here and they're not, they're not moving uh, over to the other group. And they're the people who are in the Bitcoin community who aren't in it for the sound money, of course, are going to try to reject that, that subsumption. Um, 
So yeah, I think it's uh, something that happens in all groups that uh, reach a certain size is that they they start to have these splinter groups. And I, th- I think Bitcoin is starting to get there. The community is big enough that there's a lot of disagreement among unimportant things. So you get the progressives and you get the libertarians, you get the um, people who uh, are vegan and people who only eat meat. <laughs> and um, it forces you to decide how much you care about these other things. Are you in Bitcoin just for Bitcoin and you're willing to tolerate? Or do you think that Bitcoin entails that you have to believe certain things about food and art and whatever? Um, And some people do and some people don't. And so uh, like my political views have been welcomed with open arms by some people and, you know, I've been blocked by others. (laughs) Yeah. Know that and feeling. I know you're in the same boat. We're well, probably blocked by a lot of the same people. <laughs> so we had Callie in recently. We had a great discussion with him. And he he basically said, there is no room for ideology in Bitcoin. We have one job, one job only, which is to maximize the amount of people who have access and use censorship-resistant money. That's it. I'm paraphrasing. Did yeah, you but say that's it? pretty much what you said. Per- yeah. That's all I care about. So I, I don't care about anything else. I don't care about what you identify as. I don't care what your pronouns are. I don't care what you eat. I don't care about anything else. It's like, do you want good money? And that's all we should care about. Um, I think it's been fascinating over this this last cycle to see these different cohorts build up. This we do have a philosophers cohort now, where I couldn't have pointed to the to that four years ago. We definitely have a progressive. Couldn't have pointed to that before. We we had libertarian, or we had right wing, or we had. You know, these other different groups. We've got a European group now, like a distinct European group, but we have nation groups now. And I think this splintering is great for Bitcoin because it, it means there is no ideology. But what I want to happen, what I hope happens, is that people then start to coalesce around the idea of money and what good money is, and all the ideology can be left behind because it's so unimportant. Otherwise, it's just going to be all this infighting over fucking nonsense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, when you have the, the group start with a bunch of people who overlap not just on one thing, but on multiple things, then they have this decision to make when other people want to join the group, but don't uphold those other things. Do we let them in? It, it'll be good for the one thing, but it'll be bad for the other things. Or do we try to keep them out? 